School is like the most god-awful setting I can think of for a video game, but somehow Atlas has managed to pull off a pretty damn good series of games that involve it. I mean, from preschool all the way through university, I've been in this shit for like 80% of my life, and here I am playing games about it in my free time. I literally can't escape it. Now, what do you think of when you picture Shin Megami Tensei mixed with a school setting? It's Shin Megami Tensei IF. Released in Japan originally for the Super Famicom and later the PlayStation, SMT IF takes things from an apocalyptic disaster to a smaller scale incident involving a school being pulled into another dimension. So what's the deal with IF, huh? IF what? I mean, a lot of people know this game as the precursor to the Persona series. You have the school setting, the guardians which seem like a prototype for Personas, and even a dungeon that takes place inside someone's mind. But besides that, is it good? Well, let's take a little trip through the expanse, and maybe we can find out. Right off the bat, you can tell this game isn't fucking around. You take a quick personality quiz, and then you're in class for all of 15 seconds when shit hits the fan. Before too long, you're behind the gym being tit-whipped by a pack of dogs. Now the story of this game is honestly pretty paper thin and I basically summed it up already. There's this bullied kid named Hazuma. He tries summoning a demon to get revenge, things go wrong, and the whole school falls into another dimension. Hazuma declares himself the demon emperor, and that's it. You have to find a way out. Easy enough. Now, if you haven't played this and you're expecting any sort of heavy character-driven stories or interactions like in Persona, you're not going to find it here. But that isn't necessarily a bad thing. Your party includes you and one other person that's decided at the very start of the game, with the rest being demons. There are only four characters you really need to worry about. One of them, Yumi, is up in your face the second you step out of the classroom. Now, I feel like Atlas wanted people to go with her because she's just immediately right there. But the best choice here is to say no, don't fall for it. See, each character goes through the game a bit differently. Yumi's route is nearly identical to another character, Reiko, Hazuma's sister, except it has less content. So for a first playthrough, go with Reiko. You could pick Charlie too, he's like grabbing his nuts and shit, but again, although his route's a little different, you're missing out on a chunk of content that's present in Reiko's route. Then finally, you have Akira. We'll talk about him a little later. You can't play his route until New Game Plus, and it actually takes place in a totally separate series of dungeons with different bosses and even music. If you're thinking of a typical SMT game with alignments, these characters are basically that in this game. Essentially you have Yumi as a sort of lawful, good character who wants to help people and escape the school, Charlie's more of a chaos guy who just wants to get the hell out, and Reiko is sort of a neutral rep who just wants to help Hazuma instead of escaping or leaving. And then Akira, again, is a little different. His only goal here is to get revenge. I don't know where he falls, maybe he's this game's version of like TDE or something. But anyway, before too long you're in the first dungeon of the game, the world of pride. Now each dungeon here follows a theme of one of the seven deadly sins, so strap yourselves in because we're going dick deep into each one. So, the world of pride is pretty simple for a first dungeon, and a good intro to the game. If you're coming off a newer Mega Ten game, it might feel kinda weird to adjust to the first person walking and 2D scrolling, but you should get used to it pretty quickly. Essentially, the game plays exactly what you'd expect from a Mega Ten game. You're fighting, negotiating for demons, fusing demons, exploring dungeons. You know, good shit man, it's all here. There's not any super special combat, there's no press turn or anything, but it's surprisingly addicting despite how simple it is. If you played any other Mega Ten, pretty much everything feels similar here. This level goes by pretty quick and features no real puzzles of any sort, so really you shouldn't have any trouble with this one. Now after this comes the world of gluttony. A little harder than the last with some tricks like one way doors, but overall more of the same. Now, once you get to the second half of this dungeon though, it starts to get a little shitty. So you end up in some monster's colon or something, and the encounter rate is high as shit, encounters almost every step. You can't negotiate with the demons in here, and everything looks the same, just like walls and walls of ass. Personally, I hated this part. I was still new to the game, my resources were constantly running low, and I just couldn't keep up with all the encounters. If you keep trying, you'll make it through, but you have to be a little patient. But listen up, if you thought being up some monster's ass was bad, you have no idea what you're in for after this one. The world of sloth will test your patience like no other experience you've ever had. 
They must have called it the World of Sloth because the dungeon designers huffed lead paint and passed out for four days, and then they just moved on to the next dungeon. The gimmick with this one is that students have been like moved to this world to dig tunnels, a punishment for their laziness. So the item you need to move on is at the end of one of these tunnels, right? Now to get to the end, you have to wait six full moon cycles, one cycle per section of the tunnel. That's some shit. Do you know how long that is? Walking around these hallways, just grinding and grinding. It took me at least four hours of just straight walking to get past this part, and I'm not exaggerating. This is probably the worst dungeon I've seen in a video game. Practice your social skills, because you're gonna be simping hard for this fairy. She might as well quit her OnlyFans, because I gave her enough maca to buy whatever she wants. Your health and MP are gonna wear down from endless grinding, and after a while, you'll start to wonder if you're even making progress. Mute the game, turn on some music, put in your ass plug, because you're gonna be in these hallways for a long time. Now here's a little tip from your old pal Marshall. You're gonna be killing these green dogs by the dozen, so go ahead and recruit one while you're at it. And then after that, get an angel too from the bottom floor. Fuse these together, and you get Unicorn, who has the Estoma skill, which means you can just walk around the hallways and avoid random encounters. On the plus side, it'll go by a bit faster. On the bad side, you miss out on leveling up about 20 times. Now if you have an emulator, you can turn up your game speed, but I actually played through this entire thing at normal speed just to see how long it would take. It takes a long time. By the time this shit was over, I developed some kind of like Stockholm Syndrome for this level and I actually didn't want it to end. I was like starting to enjoy just walking around this stupid hallway. I guess the developers wanted you to feel like you were actually in hell or something. I mean, I gazed into this abyss for four hours and I think a part of it is just permanently embedded into my soul. I still see these tunnels when I close my eyes. If you can make it through that, you're like contractually obligated to finish this game. Do not give up after Sloth, that's the worst part. So after that, if you make it past, you're on the world of Envy. After the mind-numbing hell that was the world of Sloth, the shit this dungeon throws at you will make you ejaculate because it at least stimulates your brain a little bit. You got dark rooms, pitfalls, slip and slide bullshit. It's all here and man, you're gonna like it. Reiko even ditches you for Chad at the start, probably because she thought you were so stupid for running up and down a hallway for six days straight. You know, I like this dungeon despite the abundance of dark rooms and teleport mazes. Use your auto map, find one on Google, I don't care. Either way, the mazes in this dungeon are orgasmic compared to what you just went through in Sloth. So you get to the top of the place, Reiko calls you a useless sack of shit, you beat up Lilith, and it's on to the next. The World of Greed. This actually ended up being one of my favorite levels of the game. The gimmick here is pretty cool. The more treasure you take from this place, the more powerful the boss is at the very end. The puzzles here are more of the same from before, maybe even a bit easier than Envy. If you get to the end without opening any chests, this tiny fox comes out, and you beat the shit out of it. Well, at least we aren't greedy, right? You might think you're getting off easy, but then you have to fight your giant robot teacher, and if you don't use debuffs on this guy, he'll vaporize you pretty quick. Otherwise, he's not too bad. So you grab the last ring, and then it's back to school. We've come full circle now. Oh yeah, it's almost time to face Hazma. You know, not too bad, only about two or three of those dungeons made me want to tear my eyes out. The rest were pretty manageable. So the school is another one of those places that I felt like I was in for a really, really long time. It's essentially just a series of teleport mazes with some pitfalls. Now I'm not even going to try and yank your dick. I used a map on GameFAQs for this part, because look at this shit. That's a lot of teleports. The monsters here are pretty tough, and I haven't really talked about team building much, but that's because for most of this game it isn't important. I was using Jack Frost up until around right here actually. For this dungeon though, and the ensuing bosses, you're gonna need to fix some things up. Grind a bit, recruit some guys here, fuse some people. Basically, just get people with strong physical skills and a lot of health. You're gonna want a guy with a selection of buffs, too. So, after what feels like seven years of grinding, fusing, teleporting, all that shit, you finally get to Hazama, right? He gives you a little speech, and then it's on. Now this fight, you better have a guy that can buff, again. It's an SMT game, so you probably know that, but it's pretty important here. Hazama has a metric ass load of health, around 20,000. Now at this point, with demons that I felt were overleveled and the best equipment I could buy in a store, 
I was doing maybe 200 to 300 damage per turn. This fight ended up lasting close to half an hour, but the thing is, it's not hard. If you can match his debuffs and heal his damage, it's actually easy. It's just an endurance round, really. Hopefully you have some Somas saved up, otherwise you're likely to run out of MP near the end. Well, after a while, he goes down, and Reiko says that Hazuma's mind is still twisted, so we have to go in there and finish things off once and for all. Now, if you're like me, you're probably gonna say what the fuck after that fight, because it gives you zero XP and doesn't heal you at all. So you're basically just standing around in this man's brain, half dead and out of items. Well, I ended up walking back. Yeah, after all that, I trudged my chubby ass back to the nurse's office. Then I went all the way back to the brain. You know, this dungeon for a final dungeon is relatively simple again. The teleports in here aren't even as hard as the school, actually. You get a few spots where some Hazama lore is given to you, and you kind of start to feel bad for the guy. I mean, he did try to kill the school with demons, but you know how it is. The demons in here will wreck your shit if you're not careful. They have some instant death spells that you really need to look out for. If you have a guy with Hama, a few demons in here are weak to it, so it'll really help you speed up those encounters. After a few of these lore sections, you'll find the true final boss of the game, Big Baby Hazama. And man is he a beast. The guy who gave this dude a health bar must have done way too much crack, because after he made it a giant baby with a human sticking out of its forehead, he gave it 30,000 health. The boss is level 90. For reference, when I finally beat the fight, I was maybe 55 or 56. You have to come to this fight prepared. My first attempt was with a mediocre guardian, one Soma to restore MP, and the same demons as the first Hazuma fight. Let me just say, if you're dealing 300 damage per turn on this fight like I was, you might miss out on your kid's graduation because you're going to be here for like 25 years. That's like 100 turns. Insane. You have a few options though, yeah, basically it just comes down to patience again like everything else in this game. You're gonna have to do one last grind to get the last few things we need to beat Mega Fias. Now first I'd suggest you get one of the highest tiered guardians you possibly can. Google a list of them and grind for it, it's worth it, trust me. Once you have a high enough guardian, and you're gonna love this part believe me, you will love it, walk all the way back to the Domain of Envy. If you just told me to fuck myself, I don't blame you. I told myself that a few times on the way back. Yeah, but really, it's worth it. Tucked inside the fourth floor of this dungeon is a flaming ass sword called Hino Kagatsuchi that you can only pick up if you have a high ranking guardian. You're gonna want this. Besides being cool as shit and playing an animation of like 50 explosions when you hit something, it does a lot of damage. But even with the damage output of this sword, you're still gonna be fighting Hazuma for a good while. So it helps you cut down the fight from like 9 hours to maybe 4. Obviously I'm kidding, but the fight after I got the sword and had a good guardian, it still took me about like a half hour. So if you thought the sword was enough though, you're just too easy, come on man. Obviously we gotta go gamble next. Yeah, or as I did, buy the fucking tokens instead of playing go fish with an Indian man in the basement. Go to a casino, there's one in gluttony, get tokens, and buy as many Rasta candies as you possibly can. Yeah, luster candy in this game, to my knowledge, isn't a spell, it's an item. So get these, it will really help you later. While you're at it, find some HP and MP restoring items, save your somas if you have any. There's a shop in the Domain of Greed that sells all this stuff, and another item that you're going to need called Final Saves. Get these. Hazuma can cast instant death spells, and these will save your ass. I bought like 9 of these Final Saves, and ended up using all of them. Now, once you have this sword, a good guardian, luster candies, final saves, and some MP restoring items, I think you're set. Nice. Now, you might want to recruit a few guys from the brain too. Maybe this guy, Ganesha, he's got like a 900 health. Anyone you can find to tank some of his hits. So now trudge all the way back through the school and the brain, and you're at his fight again. Pay attention on this one. Keep your buffs up, your final saves up, and just keep swinging. The new sword is really going to help you, and after a long fought battle, Hazuma finally goes down and you're left to watch an ending that's surprisingly poignant. I'm not going to spoil that here, I'll leave it for you when you play it to see. So the credits roll, and that's it for Reiko's route. So what do I think then? Honestly I really like this game all things considered. 
The combat was simple but satisfying. You know, even without that many characters or dialogue, the game does a great job of having this surreal atmosphere. If you've ever played a game like Yume Nikki or something, you might know what I'm talking about. You feel very alone in this game, like you're discovering something not many people have seen. There's a lot of strange things that go on, like the monster's stomach going into a guy's brain and that robot teacher. Not to mention all the weird guys that live in the expanse. And there really isn't that much reaction from like you, your party, or the human characters. So essentially it leaves a lot up to your imagination, and I appreciate that. So if really nails it in the atmosphere department. So is the game worth it? Yeah, I'd say you should try it. For patient people that really like SMT, you'll probably love this game. And if you don't like outdated mechanics and you can't sit through a few tedious and confusing dungeons, well, try it anyway, you might like it. It kinda grows on you. If I had to place this game on like a tier list or something from S to E, personally I'd probably give it a B. There's a few particularly painful flaws that hurt the experience, but again, if you're patient and the game's atmosphere catches you, it's really worth it. Maybe a C if you consider that most people don't like suffering as much as I do. I've seen a lot of opinions on this game, and it's usually pretty polarizing, either you love it or you hate it. Well, I urge you to give it a try. There's a few guides out there to help you, and it's not a hard game. It just requires some effort and a little bit of waiting. So, we're done with the game then, right? Well, no. You didn't forget about Akira, right? Yeah, his route is entirely different from the other three. Like I said, new setting, harder dungeons, harder bosses, new music. So, I'm gonna give it its own video. I don't want to half-ass Akira and shove him in at the very end here, and I think there's a lot to talk about for his route. So until then, thanks for watching, and I'd love to hear what you guys think of this game too. There's not too much I could find out on YouTube about it, in English at least, so yeah, if you want to discuss what the game's like to you below, feel free. I'll see you guys in the next video.